All right. Good evening. So, so I think that we have almost everyone in from the hallways. Uh, I would encourage everyone to grab a seat. Hopefully everyone has uh, something to wet their throat. So we have a very, very exciting evening planned. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Melissa Sampson. On behalf of AIAA and the AIAA Diversity Working Group, I am very happy to welcome everyone tonight to our keynote Women at SciTech event. Uh, this is an event that we hold every year. It's a really great networking event, and it's also an opportunity to hear from significant leaders in the field on what they have done, their career, and to hear a little bit more about them. So on behalf of AIAA and Heather, I will say thank you very much for coming out tonight. So to introduce Heather a little bit, some of you may have heard her speak on Monday and seen her around the conference. So if you don't know her yet, Heather Bulk is the CEO and co-founder of Special Aerospace Services and the SAS Flight Factory. SAS is a leader in aerospace systems engineering solutions. And a little bit of background about Heather. So prior to SAS, she spent over 17 years as a senior executive in financial planning to some of the country's most affluent families and business owners. She has her executive juris doctorate. She has a master's in taxation and a bachelor of science degree in finance. She represents uh, SAS and other small businesses at multiple Colorado and national business organizations, and she's an instrument rated pilot. And notably, Heather's very dedicated to promoting the inclusion of women at SAS and the space industry in general. This commitment includes her support of ongoing education initiatives at the state of Colorado and also at national levels, as evidenced by her high, high engagement and wonderful talks here at SciTech this week. She's a passionate STEM supporter and is engaged in bringing science and education together through direct interaction in both Boulder County and Denver, Colorado schools. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and someone who I greatly admire, Heather Bulk. Thank you, I'll give you, you're welcome. <laughs> Good evening, thank you, Melissa. Here comes the slide. So I'm pleased to be here with you tonight and I'm gonna share my story. And um, I, uh, I actually am gonna begin by telling you how I got here tonight. So the, the evening uh, when Melissa invited me to, to the event I was sitting at the Bulk family table and that entails my husband and my three kids. So I w we were talking about our day, and I said, I'm really honored to be invited to speak to this event. And then I went on this long dissertation to my three kids and my husband, and I said, and here are all the reasons why I can't possibly do it. And it was, you know, I sounded quite, quite profound in my responses, I thought. <laughs> my 13-year-old uh, my daughter casually looked up for me, and she said, Mom, don't be such a chicken. And so I... <laughs> so, I, so I am embracing the 13-year-old perspective, and here I am. So I've been flying for just over 15 years now, and this summer I bought a new airplane. And it's fast, it's turbocharged, and it's amazing. So here's the only problem. My old Dakota, not the same plane. So I had to quickly learn how to fly this aircraft. So it was back to sitting beside a flight instructor after all of these years. It was pretty painful. Um, so Josh was quick to give me guidance, and I mean a lot of guidance. And he was giving me a play-by-play -play about how to fly this new aircraft. So finally, about the fourth flight in, I said, Josh, look, I got to learn how to fly this airplane on my own, even if it is a little bit different than how you might fly this airplane. He said, sounds good. And then his eloquent response, he said, just don't screw it up. And I said, okay. So after a few flights, uh, I haven't screwed it up. And, uh, you know, it, um, it's, it's one of the most exciting passions that I have with this new airplane. You can kind of tell I'm a little giddy over this thing. 
So one of the things that I realized about my passion for flying is not too similar from my passion for running a business. Flying an airplane, the, the, the elements of that are it's fast paced, it's high risk, and it's exhilarating. And I always have to think ahead of the aircraft, and I always have to think ahead of the business as well. So as the CEO of a small business, I'm flying fast every single day. I do, however, have the luxury of seeing our industry from a different perspective. Because I have a small company, my perspective is different than most of yours, not all. I have what I call an aerial perspective. So I don't work for NASA, I'm not an executive at Boeing, and I'm not an engineer at Blue Origin. So my perspective is significantly different. I get to play in all of the sandboxes. I get to do everything from talk to the CEOs of your companies to talking to the heads of government leadership, NASA, the Air Force, to having interesting conversations with Jeff Bezos about his new space programs. And then, sometimes in the same day, I have to rapidly switch gears and figure out from a business perspective how to apply technical capabilities uh, from a business perspective and actually figure out how to turn a profit in my business. And then my favorite thing is sitting down with my team and believe it or not, I've actually had conversations like this. Yes, Doug, we will have the same opportunities provided to women that we do men. Katie will get that job interview, and she'll have the same opportunity that everyone else has had in this company. Ironic, right? Even in a company run by a woman, we still have these conversations. So what I get to see in the day of the life of Heather is this, this interesting, the industry itself is fascinatingly different than it was 11 years ago when we started this company. And that's actually what I want to talk about tonight with you, is what's changed. How has SAS addressed those changes? And, and what I think we need to do in order to keep up with this rapidly shifting industry of aerospace. So what has changed? I will say, in my opinion, it's the power. I'll tell you that it's the technology, obviously. It's who has the money, and most importantly, who now has the ear of the customer. Traditional roles and expectations and our understanding of the usual suspects, as I like to say, in this industry have been completely shaken up. My husband likes, likens it to uh, you know, those little snowy globes that you had when you were a kid. They're filled with water with a little village in there. And when you shake it up, it looks completely than it, different than it did. And, and that's what he says our industry is all about right now. You set the globe down, it settles, and then you shake it up, and, um, and it's changing that rapidly. And that applies to genders, companies, and technologies. I think I could probably fairly say that it applies to everyone in this room as well. So here's a great example of how roles can change. My director of human spaceflight, Wayne Hale, managed the shuttle program at NASA for years. He was, as I would say, he's a pillar in the industry, he's an icon in the industry. And so what he did shocked a lot of people. He came to work for SAS. And he joined this small, agile company because he knew he could have tremendous impact in this new space environment at SAS. And I can tell you, he most certainly has. With a record number of development programs in motion, new players, and major shakeups in the status quo, some of us might wonder, where do I fit in? What's my role? And how do I navigate this constantly changing environment? Well, let me share with you a little bit about how we've navigated this environment and actually lived to tell about it. And I'm going to take you behind the scenes and behind the curtains of a small business, so buckle up. We started SAS at the worst possible economic time in 2007 in the midst of a market collapse. And just a tiny detail, I was seven months pregnant with our second child. So nothing like conventional timing. And we founded the company based upon Tim, my husband and business partner's crazy ideas, and my unconventional implementation of strategy. There we go. 
go. Tim was an irreverent NASA engineer. Any of you who knew him can attest to that. Um, and he had more creativity than he did sense. And me, the financial advisor of these very wealthy business owners, took the leap to start SAS. So I was the foreigner in this industry. And I was in shock and awe by the government oversight and complexity and compliance that this industry has. And quite frankly, it's the we've always done it this way approach. Classic example of this was when we started to work with NASA that first year in business. And uh, I, was, I was on the phone with the NASA procurement officer. And he said, yes, we're ready to move forward. We want to engage with SAS. And I said, super. He said, so what we're going to need you to do is um, go get another contractor to do that. And I said, so as we walked through, they said, so let, let me get this straight. You want me to go find another company, likely our competition. You want me to give them all of our pricing, our statement of work, and, and then you, NASA, are going to contract with them. Then they're going to contract with us so that you can get access to us. He said, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, you know, I come from a free market economy. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And you can imagine the NASA procurement officer didn't laugh. So we did what it took to get that contract in place. And that contract, as we moved forward, anyone who knows me won't be surprised we didn't find ourselves in that situation again. And that approach of man with the crazy ideas and the woman with that scrappy, do it different approach um, and implementation really set us in motion at SAS. And successes for our company came rapidly and they came often from that point forward. Um, so much so that we moved out of the basement with our shag carpet, got an office, and then we started hiring employees, which when I think back on those conversations, it's pretty funny. I mean, they went something along the lines of, hey, Bill, I was thinking, you want to leave that big company, leave all that security, and um, give, up, give up some of those benefits you might have. Um, compensation's not as good. Hours are long, but there's probably a lot of potential upside. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it, it's quite funny. And how anyone, much less 83 people, bought into that venture is beyond me. Um, but my realization from that was that people were looking for something different. They were looking to share their passion. And they were looking to really do this differently in this industry. So our team that we built helped us to win contracts for commercial crew, cargo to station, DARPA R&D projects, and the list goes on. Um, and and one, of the, one of the exciting turning points for me was when Tim and I were sitting back in DC at the DARPA office for the uh, TTO office. And that tactical technology office was really our bread and butter. And uh, we were sitting in there, and uh, the head of TTO, he said, um, you know, I'm extremely curious um, you know, who you guys are. Um, and he said, it's interesting technology, but I got to tell you, do you have any idea? You guys are going toe to toe with the big guys. And uh, I smiled and nodded and walked out of there thinking, man, we're really on to something now. I also knew we were hitting a cadence when we started winning awards. And our prime contractors were giving us Small Business of the Year awards year after year, which is such a huge compliment. It means you're doing something right. Uh, so we took great pride in that. Um, in 2016, we won the Inc. 5000 award, and I thought, oh, that's probably a fluke. When we won it again in 17, I thought, maybe not so much. You know, maybe we're starting to get some altitude in this business. Um, roll forward 11 years, and we've got four locations. We've got um, 83 employees, and we're supporting every human spaceflight program in the US. We've morphed. SAS manufacturing into SAS flight factory, where we design, we prototype, we test, and we produce space and aviation hardware. And we, I might say, have direct contracts with all of the major US space companies. Tim and I are still married, and our kids seem to be turning out OK. <laughs> so one of the questions that Tim and I get asked, probably on a monthly basis, is how on earth we stay married, run multiple companies together, 
and raise three kids. And um, it seems to be such an area of curiosity, I might as well just go there. Um, to the extent that I don't talk about Russian propulsion systems, and Tim doesn't talk about compensation, he doesn't talk about return on investment, we do just fine. We keep our own space in here. Um, my role as a CEO is to make sure that we're a sustainable and profitable company, right? Tim, as the chief technology officer, his role is to make sure that the company is on the cutting edge for ideas and technologies and the implementation of those. And we both share the customer relationships and those long-term important relationships. Um, I'm known as Dr. Killjoy in Tim's view. I, I'm Dr. Killjoy for his budgets and his R&D projects. And, and Tim is, in, in my perspective, he's the nutty professor who has to be reined in from sinking the company from taking too much risk. It's all in your perspective. And, and from the team's perspective, the Heather, in their, in their view, is she's job security. She's the one who makes sure that we're here another week. And Tim, he's a ton of fun. He's the guy who's coming up with, with all these new ideas and pushing the envelope for the next project. So, for example, I went down to the flight factory in early December, and uh, I knew that Tim was working on this mobile launcher idea, but you never really know where that's going to end up. So I went down to the flight factory, and there were some, some younger engineers, and they were busily working on some, some hardware down there. And I said, hey, what are you guys working on? And they got really nervous, because <laughs> I am Dr. Killjoy. And, uh, and they said, oh, it's, it's um, and one of the new employees, because she hadn't quite learned yet, and she said, oh, it's one of Tim's projects. I said, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> so there's, so uh, the, really, uh, there's no better business partner that I would have than Tim. Um, he, he is trustworthy. He's, he's an important partner in my life. But as my Russian heritage would tell you, trust, but verify. And uh, I'll tell you that we don't always do it perfectly. Um, back at the Bulk family dinner table, um, this was probably about two years ago because Sloan was nine, and Tim and I were having a very heated discussion about an employee's performance, um, which, by the way, breaks all of those rules I talked about. And uh, our son, Sloan, had just had enough. And he looked up from the dinner table, he put his fork down, and he said, and why exactly does this person still work for you? And uh, so, so we were like, ah, yeah, a little bit of, little bit of insight at the dinner table. I, I don't know, he followed up by saying, and why don't we just have robots? But uh, <laughs> we've, we're, we're, we're not there. We're not going to embrace that nine-year-old perspective yet. Um, so, so I find a tremendous thrill that SNAS and I are doing things differently and that we're really breaking the boundaries. Um, a, an example of that was last month we were having a final interview for one of our chief engineers, Jeff. And as we're closing up the conversation, I said, hey, Jeff, just, just out of curiosity, and we've known him for a while, I said, what's the word on the street about SAS? And he kind of shifted in his chair, and he said, candidly, he said, I was talking with one of the primes, and um, he, he said, Heather, he said SAS is boxing outside of its weight class. And I was like, yeah. So, I didn't say anything to him at the moment. Tim and I got back and we said, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to be doing. That's the role we want to be in to be shaking things up. And uh, we knew that we had built the kind of reputation that we wanted to have in a company um, that cares deeply about its client relationships and, and moving that needle in this industry. And, and quite candidly, we can keep boxing outside of our weight class because we continue to do it differently which is a key to our success. So another key area um, where we have had success is because we've gotten really creative with the workforce. And anyone who knows me knows that I care passionately and intensely about this industry's workforce. Um, a few years ago, we learned some important lessons about people opportunities and workforce, and one of those situations hit a little close to home. Kenya, who's been cleaning for us for at least 10 years, um, she uh, called me up and she said her daughter, um, Danya, a little 12-year-old little girl, had taken some things from the office. And so she was reporting this to me. I thought, oh no, this is, this is terrible. I said, well, Kenya, what did she take? And she said, well, Heather, she took some brochures. 
I was like, okay. Um, and I thought, brochures, that's, that's, a, that's a little odd. Um, now instead of you know, being worried, I'm more curious about why on earth she would take these brochures. Um, so I sat down with Danya, this, um, this very sweet Latina. She's this amazingly quiet, kind, generous young girl that we've known for years. And, and let me tell you about Danya. She goes to a school in central Denver. Parents are working class, and the school is filled with mostly at-risk kids. Most of the parents didn't go to college, and like Danya, most of the parents, I don't know what percentage, didn't graduate from high school. So when I asked this little girl why she took the brochures, here's what she said. I told my teacher that I knew people who worked with NASA and in the space industry. My teacher didn't believe me, he said I was lying. I get really emotional about the story. Um, he didn't see how someone like, like me could know anyone like that. How was that even possible? So I took the brochures to bring him to school to show my teacher. And Heather, I should tell you that I took some of that astronaut ice cream you had upstairs too, but my mom didn't catch that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so what happened then? And she said, well, actually, Heather, she said it was the ice cream that made my teacher and my friends finally believe me. <laughs> so I was in total disbelief of this situation. I mean, the idea that any teacher would be dismissive of this little girl and not believe her, and, and most importantly to me, not foster that passion, um, it was shocking. So I thanked Danya for telling me, and then I found out who that teacher was. <laughs> I called the principal, and I said, hi, this is Heather, and, um, and we would like to come and talk to you. Now, this isn't the school that gets to have people from aerospace companies come and talk to them. Um, so they were a little surprised, um, but they welcomed us, and we showed up in force. We showed up with women engineers, engineers of color. We showed up in force, and we went down there, and we talked to 32 wide-eyed kids. And, and it, was, it was one of the most moving situations for myself, for Tim, as well as for these kids. And here's what I realized. There are people who want to be in this industry, but they don't have the same opportunities. They don't have the avenues for access, and, and here's the critically critical point that I want to make. They don't know how to make that happen. And so we were able to talk to those 32 wide-eyed students, inspire them, and help them believe that working in this industry in whatever capacity actually is a possibility. And I saw this as a perfect example of not just for SAS, but for this industry as a whole to have impact. And these kids have dreams, and they're often dismissed by themselves. They're dismissed by their teachers, and quite often by their parents. So after this presentation, I asked Danya what she wanted to do when she grew up. And I thought it was kind of this sweet moment. And she said, Heather, I want to be an engineer. That's all I've ever wanted. And when she said this, I realized that we had to do more. We had to do something different in this area. Um, and so in 2015, we formed the Who Dreams Wins Foundation. And this program is focused on supporting elementary, high school, and post-high school kids of all ages for apprenticeships so that they can get actual experience and get exposure in some capacity. So Danya was our first student, and she got the opportunity to learn SolidWorks. When we asked her what she wanted to do, she said, I want to do that computer design thing that you guys do that I see in the office when my mom cleans. And so uh, this, this little girl, um, through this program, at the age of 13, uh, she became SolidWorks' youngest certified person in SolidWorks. Her is her certificate. And um, we gave her a computer, and she went to town. And um, she is um, well on her way. Thank you. I was like, I'm going to clap. So 
So, so a, a really close to home story, an important story for us, and hopefully an important story for you as well. Danya's only one example, and there are a lot of kids out there who really want to be in this industry, and they're, they're told that they can't be. They're told that they're not good enough. They're told they're not smart enough. Maybe they're the wrong gender or the wrong color. And um, I, I'll tell you, one of the biggest pieces and the takeaway here is that Danya has taken it on as her personal mission to mentor other Latinas in her school who want to be in whatever kind of engineering that they want to be in. Um, and, and an update on Danya. Um, she is currently a junior at Erie High School in their specialized aerospace program. And at last count, she has six letters from universities across the nation seeking her application. I didn't have six letters, I'm just saying. <laughs> It's, uh, so in just two years, she went from having to steal ice cream to prove that she knew people in the aerospace industry to, to you know, moving forward on her own career. And it's pretty cool to watch this. So what's amazing um, in this example of how to do it different in workforce, I think it's also important to recognize that this is a hard industry to get into. And it's even harder if you're female or you didn't go to the right school and I think there are many people that I talk to who believe that we have moved past this. And my comment to you is not quite yet. I have three examples off the top of my head for women who've reached out to me to get some career advice to figure out how to get a foothold in this industry. And guess what? I give those people interviews. I hire the best candidates. And then your companies hire my company to bring them back into your company. One of my favorite stories on this topic is Jennifer. I was interviewing Jennifer for a temporary staff accountant. Uh, we had a role in our finance group, and I thought we better quickly get somebody in here and fill that gap. And running through her resume, and I looked and I saw Colorado School of Mines, mechanical engineering. And I looked up and I said, Jennifer, where's your real resume? And she said, it's in the car, but I'm here to interview for the staff accountant role. I said, I know, just go grab it. Let me take a look. And uh, it, it's, um, I've heard the same story from Jennifer that I heard over and over again. I have a degree. I've got the grades, and they're good grades. And sometimes these folks even have internships to back up what they want to go and do, and they can't seem to get an interview. And I'll tell you that today, in my hotel room, I did two Zoom interviews with two young women, same exact story. Can't get through the software in these companies to be able to just get an interview. Um, so we hired Jennifer, and she's a rock star. Um, OK, truth be known, I did put her in that finance role for a short time, because I needed her. Um, but, but we quickly got her some exciting work. And you know, as much as I love to tell this story, she's much better at telling the story than I am. And she loves to tell everyone out there. Um, the irony here, right? We're all so starved for STEM kids. We're starved for engineering graduates. And it's, it's interesting. These people want to be in space and aviation. Um, and I'm a believer that we're missing some of those really critical gems out there. People who, um, they're passionate, they're smart, and they're talented people, and we're missing them. Um, so if you're really serious about your workforce, you know, think about digging a little bit deeper, and, and you might just find those Jennifers or those Danyas. So if, um, one of the other questions I get a lot is, how on earth do you balance being a mom CEO of a couple companies, um, flying an airplane and staying current and, and married to Tim, right? That last part. So, um, and, and to be very clear, I have broken all the rules in all of those areas, very intentionally. Um, I refuse to have the roles of all or nothing in any of these areas. Um, I've never pretended to have balance. Quite frankly, it's a, it's a passing thought in my world. And, and most importantly, uh, I make no apologies for being a mom. I am a mom first and foremost. And you know what? I'm a better leader because of it. So 
So I affectionately call Sierra Sloan and Sawyer my board of directors. Um, I know who, uh, who I report to. Um, I've rocked a child in a meeting with a retired undersecretary of the Air Force, but I've also slipped out of volunteering in my kid's class to take a call from NASA over a billing issue. Um, I've celebrated my 10-year anniversary for my marriage at an Atlas launch. And uh, it, you know, all clear lines and boundaries, in my opinion, are gone. Um, but, but something that I want to message here, especially to the younger folks, is this company has allowed the venue for me to be able to do this, um, things that otherwise would not have been possible. This is my uh, very now not sick um, little guy, three pounds. Um, so I don't have balance. I have priorities. Um, and I do believe and I hope that I am modeling what is possible for men and women, especially in this industry. So when I think back on my 11 years in running this business, 13 years of being a mom, 15 years of flying, and 18 years of marriage, I take the greatest pride and I've done every one of those differently. I've seen us grow from two people working out of the basement, trying to figure out how on earth we're gonna make this dream happen of running this company. Now we've got multiple companies, 83 people um, working with us and direct contracts with our clients now, and a reputation that allows us to have entree behind the curtains of our clients. And that is the biggest possible compliment that any of our clients could give us. So in the beginning, uh, when I started talking, I was talking about having the good fortune of seeing this industry from a really broad perspective. Um, and as I look into the future, this is where I see the industry going. I see more companies like SAS. Um, I see more small companies, agile companies, hiring a more diverse workforce, um, and people who are thinking outside of the box. In aerospace, we're always going to rely on the wisdom and the experience of the past. But I think that era of the way we've always done it is gone. And I think now it's the era of do it different in so many capacities of what each, each and every one of you are doing. So back in the 1800s, Wilbur Wright said, it's not really necessary to look too far in the future. We see enough already to be certain it will be magnificent. Only let us hurry and open those roads. And I'm proud of what we've been able to contribute to the industry, to human spaceflight, and to the future that I know will be magnificent. So let us hurry and open those roads. And remember, this is going to be dramatic because it's going to peel up here, that who dreams wins. It'll come up in a minute. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. I really like your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what is uh, that your company did uh, very different? Like the main thing that you consider, like we are doing something different? Well, I think there were a multitude of things that we did differently. Everything from um, not doing it the way that everybody else does. So if someone said, well, in order to start in this industry, you have to be a subcontractor several tiers down, we said, well, why? And I think we questioned every single thing. Um, and it's a delicate balance between challenging how this industry is run and still being compliant and st still, still falling in line enough to, to make that happen. Um, but I really think we questioned every avenue. Hi. I'm just wondering um, how 
people perceive you working with your husband? Like, do you get a lot of questions like, oh, um, like, do people think he's the main driving force and how do you handle that? Yes, such a good question. We could talk for hours on this topic. <laughs> so, uh, I, have a, um, I have a husband who um, is a huge proponent of women in this industry and women in power in general, right? Um, so, the, the, somebody made the mistake the first year in business and they said, well, Tim, your, your wife is just the face. She's, she, doesn't, she doesn't really help you in that company, right? And I think that spurred this moment of, wait a second. Um, so, so the positioning is, is very important. And, and we're really clear. Um, it goes like this. I'm, I'm the CEO, and I run the business and the operations, and I keep people paid and out of jail. And he's got those crazy ideas. Um, and, and you know, quite frankly, I think it took a few years for people to understand how that worked. Um, and now, you know, my team, Wayne and, and um, you know, most of our team will say, Tim will say, I've got an idea, we're, we're going to go chase this. And then they'll look to me and say, is that OK? You know, so, but it took a while. This question is geared towards the determined fighting spirit core of your company. One of my mentors, who is a naval aviator nearby Naval Air Station North Island, he is the son of the first Royal Air Force uh, Special Air Service, and they have a very similar insignia. Their motto is, who, he who dares wins. And I'm yeah. wondering if there's a relationship between the, S the Royal Air Force SAS motto and your company's motto. So yes, I was not responsible for naming the company. Uh, so this was Tim sitting in the basement. And I, I would often ask him, I said, are you working? Or are you, it turns out he was reading some old books on SAS. And um, uh, all joking aside, it, it is. It is based upon that. So the SAS, the British SAS, is who dares wins. And um, so Tim came up with this, who dreams wins. And um, the, the British either love us or they hate us. So I'm a student leader in uh, an aerospace group at my university. And we have what I think is an unusually large number of women involved, uh, but I acknowledge that they have a, an uphill battle. And one of them even, she did get an internship, but she had such a bad experience at that internship that uh, she actually dropped out of the program altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I think that's a little bit of an anomaly, but even so, this is this is a, a problem. And uh, I was I was wondering, would you be willing to come to my school and <laughs> give this talk <laughs> and inspire the young women in my program? Absolutely. Hi, how do you uh, deal with self-doubt? What you would, would you say to yourself to handle this kind of situation? That, that feeling I get at least once an hour <laughs> throughout the day. Um, so so there, there's self-doubt for being a woman in the industry. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of not, that's not something I'm really too worried about at this point. We're in our 12th year in business. Um, the the self-doubt for me is running a business. And if any of you have had any exposure in a small business, it is like riding a terrifyingly fast roller coaster on a daily basis. Um, the, uh, the, the curves get there, you know, the sign, we kind of level out quite a bit the longer that you're in business. Um, so. Uh, we got a little sick and crazy and decided to start another business in, uh, in 2015. But it is, um, it's, it's fascinating how, um, how those you've got to calm yourself constantly and say, but I'll tell you, mentors are one of the biggest things that you can do in this. It, it doesn't even, it's not even industry specific. Mentors are those to say, hey, I had those thoughts too, or hey, I felt that way. Here's what I did to overcome that. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of mentors. In, in many capacities, and that self-doubt is real, and I think to the extent that we deny that, it's, um, it's not gonna serve anyone. Okay. Um, what uh, advice do you have for people who are working in large companies that are very constrained by government regulations? 
for how to do things differently in our current positions. Well, there's the challenge, right? And, and I believe that the larger organizations are shifting. But remember, I'm a speed boat, and you're a Titanic. Right? So you're going to, when you turn, everyone knows. Right? When I turn, they're like, oh, she's going in circles again. It's not, uh, it's not the same. But when your leadership embraces that change, you know, you're talking about two things. One is culture, and one is bureaucracy, and then there's compliance. And, you know, we've touched on this a little bit the other day. Um, so your contribution to your culture and how those things shift, I think, is imperative. And my, my comment to you would be get involved and talk to your leadership. And, and if you're not doing that, um, then you run the risk of being the person who's complaining but not changing and, and be that agent of change. Um, but it'll take you longer. But once you're there, you're there. Thank you for your presentation. Um, as, as was just mentioned, how, how do we obtain a long-term mentor without being overbearing? How do you obtain one? Um, have a good relationship with that person. And it might not be your first mentor, right? I've had several mentors throughout my life. And, and I think the idea of um, being able to have multiple mentors and being able to in, embrace the idea that sometimes that shifts, um, having a long-term relationship is being able to have a win-win. What does that mentor learn from you, right? Um, and I think that understanding that the mentor-mentee relationship is it's twofold. When I mentor somebody, don't kid yourself, I get a ton out of it. And every time I'm giving advice, I'm saying, yeah, make, make note to self. And uh, so, so I think just think about that when you're having your dialogue with your mentors or if, if, if you're mentoring somebody else. You know, how does that relationship win both ways? Um, my name is Barack al -Rawi. I'm a third year mechanical engineering major at the University of California, Merced. So UC Merced is a unique compared to other universities in that it, it traditionally serves lower income communities in our state. Um, we're the only majority um, Hispanic UC. And I can see from your speech and uh, from your Wikipedia page that you're, <laughs> that you're passionate about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Um, UC Merced is at a bit of a disadvantage to other UCs because we're new. Um, our first graduating class was in 2009. So I was wondering if you would be interested in coming to UC Merced. <laughs> <laughs> and giving a, I'm going to go back to the picture of my airplane. If, we, if there's a landing strip there, yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, there's Castle Airport about a few minutes from there. <laughs> yeah. so, so let me speak to that. and, and um, you know, I think it's really, really important to understand that we've got some privileged schools, and those schools produce really, really good engineers. We also have some schools like your school, or like I sit on MSU Denver's board, um, and that is a very strong Hispanic population as well. Um, they don't get the same job offers. They don't get that same avenue. When I go to CU Boulder, Purdue, Ohio State, um, it's a different experience. And so one of my big passions um, is to get the avenues. You know, Lockheed Martin has it figured out. Lockheed Martin is recruiting from MSU Denver. And I'm like, well, how did you guys do that? And you know, th they've found that avenue to tap into some of those really great students to graduate. And uh, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you and, and have that discussion, because really, it's those relationships with those prime contractors, with those Titanics, right? because they're the ones who can help make a difference. And once they understand what kind of students are coming out of that university, then th that, that's a gold mine for, for these prime contractors and small companies like mine. So, yeah. Hi, I wanted to ask, um, how do you recommend dealing with um, maybe smaller issues of sexism in the workplace? For instance, um, people talking over you in meetings or talking mainly to your male colleagues when you are the one who's supposed to be answering the question or, I, I don't know, like telling you to smile more or something like that. How do you recommend dealing with that graciously so that you can still rise up in the workplace but you're not ruining your relationships with your colleagues? Were you sitting in my meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was in a meeting and um, actually Tuesday down at the flight factory and I didn't handle it graciously. 
Um, we hired a consultant to tell us, um, in his opinion, everything we did wrong. And, and it was interesting because Tim was sitting in one chair and I was sitting here and the consultant was there and I said, well, quite frankly, I think it's an HR issue. If you think about, and he looked at me and he said, it's not. And then he would talk to Tim and I was like, hmm. So it, it's forever an issue for me about how to navigate that. I got up and got a cup of coffee and never came back. That's probably not how I would advise you to handle that. But it's, um, it's, if it were an employee, if it were a client, I would handle it extremely different. Uh, that was not the best way to handle it. Um, but I think that the idea of handling it with grace so that you, you can move that needle, day by day, move that needle. And I heard an interesting conversation last night, and it was, it was in regards to a sporting event. And in that sporting event, it was the idea of not letting parents and coaches talk to the kids a certain way. And what it is is it's slow training. And, and you can lose your cool in that meeting, but I don't think the message is going to get through as well as if you keep your cool and then having those calm, repeatable messages and, and being patient through that. That has been normally, not, not uh, yesterday, but normally how I handle those situations. Um, and I, I'll grant you it's not easy. So, well, thank you. Wow, uh, that is the only word I have. Uh, Heather, this has been absolutely inspiring, as I knew it would be, and I'm so pleased that you chose to share your journey uh, with just what you've done up through today, with so much more to come uh, with us this evening. So on behalf of AIAA and be on behalf of myself, thank you so much for speaking tonight. Let's give her another round of applause. So with that, uh, we have time left for net networking, about another 30 minutes. We offer you to either go back out into the hallways, enjoy your evening, spend some time with each other this evening talking about your stories and your journey and looking to the future. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>